so you, you know, we use the term heresy. So, uh, so heresy versus orthodoxy. So orthodoxy is, is the idea of, you know, what is the right teaching? What do, it, we are always focused on what is it that we teach? What do we stand for? What is truth? And if you're going to take a stand on what is the truth, you are, by definition, taking some stand on what is not the truth. And sometimes it's just as important to be able to say what is not the truth as what is the truth. So it, this has been fundamental to the church from the very beginning. What do we believe and what do we not believe? And so orthodoxy is the idea of what is the teaching that we believe that is really true? What constitutes the actual truth that we teach, that we believe, that we know this is right. This is what God is telling us. So, an orthodoxy from the very beginning is not determined by a majority vote. It's not determined by one person. There's no individual in the church in the first century who's empowered to say this and not that on their own. And there is nothing in the first century where you get the whole church together and you show of hands, what do you think? There is instead a, a sense that we need to get the key leaders of the church together and they need to pray together and consider this together and talk together and to come to some consensus together. And that orthodoxy, deciding what is true and what is not, is a function of leadership. Thus, we see the Jerusalem Council that happens in Acts 15, uh, in AD 50, uh, to confront one of the first big controversies in the church. You bring all the key leaders of the church, but it's not an open meeting. It's not all comers, it's the leaders. It's by invitation, basically. And the leaders get together and pray and discuss and hear these things and operate in a very egalitarian kind of a way. There's, uh, it's not a hierarchical kind of a meeting, and it's not very process-driven, it appears, but it's about these leaders as peers in the church praying together and seeking to know what it is that God would, uh, would teach us. Um, Jacob. Yeah, so, so we use the word orthodoxy. Of course, that's an English term, but uh, in, in English, and it derives from a Greek term. But, but the idea from very early on of right teaching, think about the way that Paul writes, particularly in the pastoral epistles. What is he telling uh, Timothy and Titus? He's emphasizing right doctrine, truth, knowing, ex knowing what is true and putting upon them the responsibility to teach that which is right doctrine. Uh, that's a point that he makes to both Timothy and Titus. Uh, and so this sense that right teaching is a responsibility of church leaders goes to, to the New Testament era. Uh, it's, it's something that is fundamental to that age. So they're not using the term, you know, term orthodoxy, but that, that sense of right doctrine, which is basically the same idea, um, is something that Paul is writing about and is a key thing in the early church. Yeah, so, so we use the term heresy, heretics. Uh, heresy comes from this idea of choice. Uh, and so people who choose to go a different way is what, you know, when you say somebody's a heretic, you're saying they've chosen to go a different way than what orthodoxy says, than what the truth of the church is. They've chosen to go their own way for the most part. And so most heresies are, I've got an idea, and I think that this is right, and I'm going my own way. Um, I'm going to do my own thing. Uh, that's basically the history there. Um, so, uh, so, but 
But the idea of dealing with people whose conception of the gospel is wrong. This is part of the story of Peter and Simon Magus in Acts. Peter sees Simon Magus as not understanding fundamentals of the truth and, you know, strongly rebukes him and maybe casts him out of the church. It's hard to say exactly, uh, but tradition says that Simon Magus was cast out of the church uh, because he, he did not believe what became or the right teaching, the right doctrine, what became orthodoxy. He rejected that and went his own way, went on his own thing. Uh, and so, uh, so in the early church, the idea of heresy is you know, a person, probably based on some insight that they've had themselves, is, is, uh, is created or is shopping around some distorted understanding of the truth or has introduced something into what the church believes are key doctrines. Uh, you know, when John was talking the other night about big C convictions, about stuff that we cannot compromise on, about fundamentals of the gospel, about how do we be saved, things like this. Who is God? Uh, there are core questions that we cannot be compromised on because we cease to be Christians when we fail to do these things. There is something that makes Christianity Christianity and which is non-negotiable. And so as we think about what are the things that are not negotiable, the things that are fundamental, the things where we cannot bend, and those are not things, you know, what is it that splits the church anymore? You know, music, and, and, and no, it's not those things. <laughs> Those, those are not the big C items. Those are mostly preferences. You know, how, what time do we meet? That's a preference. Uh, the big convictions are about, you know, it, it, how is Jesus God? You know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does that mean? How may I be saved? Those. Those are the big things. Those are the cores of the faith. What kind of buildings you build, uh, what kind of music you use, these things are preference kinds of things. Uh, and so heresy is, uh, th that's not what Christianity is. And not, you know, my opinion about Christianity, and not, that's not what Christians do, but no, there's something, there's something about the core of what Christianity is that you've got wrong. And you, when corrected, reject the correction and go off your own way. That's, that's the point of heresy. So, uh, so we, have, we have the issue, of course, that down through the years, um, the, the term heresy has been hugely corrupted. Okay? It's, it's been uh, uh, abused in the church. Okay? Uh, it's been used to run people out of the church that I don't like or that aren't like me. It's been abused by the church in the sense of how do we deal with people who don't believe. Um, you know, people tend to think when they think about heresy and heretics today, they tend to think, you know, Spanish Inquisition or something. Um, and they tend to think about horrible abuses that were con committed by church authorities under the name of dealing with heresy. And of course, many of those things were not actually heresy at all. Um, these were fights about power and other things. Now, inquisition is a term, and I, we'll talk about this more later, but uh, inquisition is a term that actually the inquisition throughout much of the history of the church was actually a pretty good tool to go and find out what did people believe and try to teach truth. Now, we don't remember it that way because we remember the, the, the times when it turned into kind of the Gestapo, okay, uh, uh, which was real evil. Uh, there is also corruption of the term heresy uh, in the use of the term heretic uh, because there's a growing sense in the culture, and you know, this goes back at least to the late 19th century, uh, that being branded as a heretic is sort of a badge of honor. 
that it indicates that you uh, are, that you have independent thought, that you think, speak truth to power, that you stand against uh, a corrupted system or something. Uh, and so, uh, so heresy and heretics are re uh, regarded with some honor in the current era, uh, which is a problem uh, because it's about the idea of what constitutes who are we? What does it mean to be a Christian? In the first few centuries of the church, uh, you know, today, ex exactly, you've got this situation today where we tend to split because we can't agree, and so we end up with a church down the street that's a little bit different than us because it's the people that are like, no, we're not on board with this, and we want to do it that way kind of stuff. Uh, in the first century, uh, in the second and third century, the divisions tended to be much more regional. They tended to be much more, in this city, they're practicing this, or in this region, they're practicing that, or the in Armenia, the church has come to believe this, and in Egypt, they're believing that. Uh, and so the early conflicts in the church tend to be more these regional things rather than within congregations. And of course, in, in the United States, we tend to, because we are more individualist, we tend to have these, these conflicts within the body because, you know, I want to do it this way. And in the first century, much more communal society, much more, uh, most of the societies that you see in the church in the first century, people felt the need to be part of the group. And so groups tended to stick together and not divide. But it was pretty easy for them to look at groups that were far away and think, well, those people are wrong. And we're right. So today, a lot of it is, you're wrong and I'm right that causes division in the church. And so that's different, and that's cultural. That's because of the way that we see ourselves and the way we see our, our interaction with the rest of the world. Uh, and so, so divisions happen differently today. And you know, clearly there are uh, larger groups within the church that have splits anymore, and sometimes those splits are about really fundamental issues. But most splits in local churches are not about really fundamental doctrine anymore. They're much more about preferences about how we should do things. Um, there are some exceptions about uh, some, some core fundamental things that have split parts of uh, the Episcopal Church and the Methodist Church in, in the recent decades uh, that are about much deeper issues. Uh, but individual churches in general split over things that are preference. Um, uh, larger denominational splits are much more likely to be over something that is more substantive. Um, and splits between churches in different parts of the world are almost always about larger issues of doctrine and practice. Um, so, but, but the important thing to take away here is that that from the very beginning, the church has faced the issue of how do you deal with people who claim that some parts of the core of what you believe are right, but that many other parts of the, what you believe are not. And, you know, I, I think of those, I've thought of those for, as long, for a long time as the Bible and people, uh, to some extent, in the modern world. I believe the Bible and the Book of Mormon and the watchtower stuff, and this other thing. And, uh, you know, so, so it's not, the Bible becomes not the authority, it becomes one thing, potentially among other things. Um, and one of the things that you see, even today, is that, that you know, most groups want to commit them, connect themselves to the Bible somehow. They, there is something about biblical authority that even for groups that are far from Orthodox Christianity causes them to want to be able to try to bring some biblical authority into what they're doing and claim that, that something that they're doing is, is uh, supported by the Bible. Uh, so um, so these, are, these are larger issues that go back basically two millennia for us how do we deal with people that, that believe something that is fundamentally at odds with what is true? 
So two big heresies that the first century church uh, is confronting. So next slide here. Um, the, the, two, the two big heresies that you see in the first century are, you know, Paul talks about the Judaizers, as he dubs them in his letter to the Galatians, uh, and, and the Gnostics. And we see things in the New Testament that are speaking to both of these big heresies. And both of these still have echoes that play down today. Um, so, but Paul, you can see both in Acts and in particular in Paul's letter to the Galatians, Paul is talking about uh, the, the Judaizers, which, uh, you know, so Paul is writing in response to both of these. Um, and, and a couple things about these, uh, both of these things. One, both of them are mixing truth with error, which is what you see today. Uh, you know, almost anybody today that is going off track pick some things that are true to mix in with their error so they can say well we agree about this why can't you agree with me about these other things uh, and so uh, there's a tendency of course in these things to overemphasize a few scriptures and ignore or reject many others in order to get to the outcome that you want um, uh, there, there is, in both of these cases, a significant uh, impulse to, to encourage people to maintain big parts of their pre-Christian worldview, their pre-Christian life, their pre-Christian belief system, to preserve a big part of what they were before they came into the church or to preserve a big part of stuff that is from outside the church, preserve a big piece of the culture. You, it's okay, you can keep all that stuff, uh, kinds of thinking. Um, and, and both of these uh, are interesting because they play to personal vanity in some way. Uh, both of these, uh, the Judaizers said, look, you can be holy enough. You can earn it. You can live a life that is holy enough that God would honor that because you're that good. And the Gnostics basically were arguing about you can be smart enough or at least connected enough to get a hold of the real secrets that will give you the intellectual firepower to save yourself. And so both of those are playing to vanity to some extent. They're playing to the idea of there's something about you that makes you able to be basically the instrument of your own salvation. And that's why they're heresies. Because that's not true. You do not have the power. You do not have the capacity to save yourself. You are a sinner who needs a savior. And so both of these heresies are about the idea that maybe you don't need a savior. Maybe, you, maybe you're not all that bad. Maybe you can work this out yourself. Okay? And that's false. And if you're teaching that, you are doing violence to the people that you're teaching it to. And so from the perspective of the church, it is necessary to confront and as, if possible, silence such people, at least within the confines of the church. We do not allow people to stand up, to teach, to say these things within our walls, within our body. People that teach these things, we eventually, we confront them and eventually cast them out because this is not acceptable in the current era, in a, you know, based on what we believe, what, what orthodoxy says. So the Judaizers basically res, uh, uh, argued that you have to become a Jew before you can become a Christian. That if you're not a Jew and you become a Christian, you've got to go be circumcised and you've got to go do things that establish you can follow the Jewish law. And so Paul 
Paul believes in writing to the Galatians, to the people that he went and evangelized with Barnabas on his first missionary journey and returned to on his second journey, the people in places like Lystra and Iconium and Derbe, the people of those cities in the northern area that goes with that, those people had been victimized, he believes, by People coming in and saying, no, no, you've got to do all this Jewish stuff before you can do this Christian stuff. And so it's a legalism. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a focus on duty and focus on following rules here. And, and the Judaizers didn't preach almost anything that had to do with grace or love. They preached a whole lot of stuff. You've got to do it this way. You've got to follow these rules. You've got to do these things and check these boxes. And so the Jerusalem Council in AD 50 and Acts 15 uh, is to confront part of this. Um, and, you know, as I said, it's in a, kind of an open forum of leaders, not of everybody. Uh, and it's conducted in a pretty egalitarian way. And the decision is met by consensus but is led by a respected leader, in this case, James the Just, uh, who is both an apostle and an elder in the Old Testament tradition, and prayer is a basis, and they make a decision that they believe is led by the Holy Spirit, and then they write to the church to say, this is what we believe to be true. Having met together, we believe this to be true. Go do these things. So... Um, so there is a, uh, uh, a sect called the Ebionites, uh, which became a, a Christian group of sorts uh, that, uh, that lasted until 135 A.D. Uh, that, that lived and created an organized structure where they claimed to be the Ebionite Christians where you had to become Jewish before you could become a Christian. And men who joined had to become circumcised, and men and women had to adopt a significant number of things based on the Jewish law and live mostly under the Jewish law to be part of the Ebionite Christian group. Um, so uh, the name means uh, the impoverished. Uh, they lived uh, ascetic lives. They revered James the Just. Um, and rejected Peter and Paul as, as men who had wandered from the one true faith. Um, uh, so uh, the Ebionites go till 135 because uh, 135 is the time of the second Roman destruction of Jerusalem during the Bar Kokhba revolt. Uh, and after that, there is zero evidence of Ebionite Christianity anywhere. Uh, it vanishes after uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in 135 A.D. But the Ebionites believed that Jesus was a, moral, a mortal man who became the Messiah because he successfully fulfilled the Jewish law. That he fulfilled the law, and that made him the Messiah. That he was just like you and me. He was just better at following the law than you and I are. Um, and so uh, they held that Matthew's gospel was true, although they didn't like the nativity stuff, so they rejected that uh, because they just thought that Jesus was born of Joseph and Mary uh, and that that was a made-up story. Uh, but they saw Paul's letters as heretical, uh, and uh, they later wrote a gospel of their own which has not survived, um, and their center became at Pella on the east bank of the Jordan, uh, which was also a significant uh, center of the Christian church at the time. Uh, the Ebionites were eventually rejected both by Jews and by Christians. Um, but but the, uh, the Judaizers, you know, that's reflected. You know, what is, what is the controversy? What is one of the fundamental controversies that's faced in the Reformation? Against works, by faith alone. Martin Luther. Is basically pushing back against what he sees as Judaizers in the Roman Catholic Church, that the Roman Catholic Church has fallen into this same works-based, process-driven kind of a thing that by faith alone is really a pushback against that. So, and you know, today, any works-based salvation has its roots to some extent in this issue. 
this idea that you have to check the boxes, you've got to follow these, follow this list, you've got to do this sort of thing. And so the Roman Catholic Church remains connected to at least a few ideas that are really tied to that. Um, anybody who believes that, you know, functionally you become a Christian because you do good works, that you live in an ethical way, um, those kinds of things are part of this. And uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church has a component that have been Judaizers for two millennia. Judaizers went to Ethiopia following the eunuch, and in the very early days of the Ethiopian church, people became committed to the idea that you become Jewish and then you become a Christian, and as a Christian you follow key elements of the Jewish law, and that still exists. That had been passed down for nearly two millennia in the Ethiopian church. So that's a piece of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church still lives in the things that Paul, writing in Galatians, is rejecting. About? The, the Ebionites really didn't believe that there was one. So... Um, they, they didn't believe that Jesus needed to be resurrected, really, that he, he was the Messiah because he'd lived a life that fulfilled the law and then died for it, and that that was what a Messiah needed to do. But that we get salvation not so much because of that work, but because we follow that example. We seek to follow after that example, and he has carved a path for us, or led a way for us, it appears. So, uh, very little Ebionite writing has survived down through the ages. So, uh, so it's, it's not certain the specifics of what they believed on a number of these things. So, um, but they were a separate part. They believed themselves to be part of the church, but taught the things that Paul rejected. It's not known, I think, whether there was any direct relationship there, but certainly there are some things that the Sadducees taught and that the Sadducees believed that had some overlap for, for the Ebionites in the sense that the Sadducees rejected the resurrection uh, before, uh, you know, from before the time of Christ, uh, and the Sadducees uh, had other uh, beliefs that minimized kind of the divinity of God uh, and God's action in the, current, in the current world. So, but the Ebionites didn't leave a big track record of written documentation that has survived. And so we don't know a lot about what they specifically believed or how they lived. Um, but they were, they were an organized and significant group. And it's one of the reasons that we remember them because because it was a group, they had leadership, they, uh, they had an order and a process of their own, and that wasn't scattered individuals, but that was an organized, structured uh, group that considered themselves to be part of the church even as the church rejected them. And they considered themselves also to be uh, fully Jewish. And, and were probably horrified when Jewish authorities also rejected them. Uh, and they found themselves kind of pushed out of both communities. Um, but, but both the Jews and the Christians of the late first century, early second century, thought that the Ebionites were trying to build a syncretistic synthesis of Judaism and Christianity and from both sides. They thought that doesn't work, that's not right. Um, so, but the Ebionites thought that they had come up with the perfect, the perfect synthesis of these ideas. So, but early on in the church, you see Paul is very strongly, what does he say to the Galatians about their fiddling around with the Judaizers and their ideas? Oh, you foolish Galatians. <laughs> Paul speaks to them more directly and more harshly than he does in any of his other letters. What's wrong with you? 
okay? So Paul doesn't see this as a minor deal. He sees this as a really important, very large deal. So, um, so but that's the Judaizers, uh, and that's a, uh, a significant uh, heresy that you see the first century church dealing with this issue of legalism and the whether you need to be under the Jewish law um, is a major element of the thought in the first century church. What is this, you know, what is the answer to this question, are we still Jews? What does that mean? But the Ebionites, their answer to the question of are we still Jews was yes. Yes, we are. So, uh, so, but this, this was a major, a major thing that people in the church were beginning to navigate in the first century. What does it mean to be a Christian? Who are we? And so these were core questions, and this is, uh, this is one thing that was really important. So we'll talk about the Gnostic thing next week. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll poke at that a little bit, but on, on Jewish issues from the first century, if Josephus or Philo didn't write about it, we don't know almost anything because there's not much others, other sources. So, um, so there's stuff that didn't interest them. They don't talk about it. And Josephus is not much interested in kind of theology sorts of stuff. Josephus had been a general. He was a military man, and he is much more interested in the politics and the warfare and that sort of stuff. And so, so there's a lot of things that interest us today about what did people believe and how do they worship that Josephus takes either for granted, as everybody knows that, so I don't need to write about it, or that he's just not very interested in. And so, uh, so he doesn't cover it in any depth or any detail. So anyway, so, uh, but we'll continue next time. Uh